Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shuja Keen. Good evening and happy Lunar New Year to you all. So welcome to the MIT Campaign for a Better World event in Palo Alto. First, let me thank our local alumni clubs for supporting tonight's event. This includes the MIT Club of Northern California and the MIT Sloan Club of Northern California. Uh -huh, a lot of Sloanies here. The turnout this evening and the energy in this room is evidence of the active engagement of our local MIT community. Moreover, all of our interests in learning more about the Campaign for a Better World. Tonight's topic is the science of teaching and learning. Now, people in this room will attest that there is no better educational institution in the galaxy than MIT that can prepare <laughs> its graduates to become problem solvers of the future. The challenge for MIT is to evolve its teaching practices continually so emerging scientists, academics, engineers, researchers, entrepreneurs, and executives come out of the institute future-proof, equipped to address the complex challenges humanities face, work on new machines, materials, systems, and solutions. The campus curriculum and the teaching models are different from the mid-90s when I was there. And as a father of three, hopefully MIT 2030s, <laughs> I'm personally interested to see how the future of education will evolve. So what happens next? There will be new ideas for educating the future problem solvers. The education landscape will continue to leverage technology to make learning more personalized, allowing for more in-depth exploration in subject matters, and more collaboration, collaborative research to innovate new solutions for humanity. However, I know with a fair degree of certainty, MIT will be leading the charge on ensuring future generations will be drinking from a high quality fire hose. <laughs> and personally, I cannot wait. During my 20 plus years of involvement with MIT, I've had the opportunity to get to know our visionary president, Rafael Raif, as well as many dedicated leaders from our institute. This evening, I am delighted to introduce one of those dedicated leaders, Eric Grimson, MIT's Chancellor for Academic Achievement, who will share with us how MIT is leading the charge for a better world. Join me in welcoming Eric Grimson. Good evening. And thank you for that wonderful welcome. Shuja, um, thank you so much for that kind introduction and for your own dedication and service to the MIT community. I also want to recognize and especially thank the members of MIT's William Barton Rogers Society for their generous support of the Institute and for being here this evening. Thank you for joining us. Many of you may not know, but MIT has a mission statement. Most of our faculty don't know we have a mission statement. <laughs> but MIT's mission says, like any, any great research university, MIT's mission directs us to educate students and advance knowledge. When MIT faculty pursue this mission, they launch disruptive new technologies, like the invention of additive 3D printing by Michael Sima and Emmanuel Sachs. They win global recognition, like the Nobel Prize in Physics awarded to Ray Weiss in 2017 for the detection of gravity waves. And they help to shape, support, and educate the kind of astounding students and graduates who both grace this stage and fill this audience tonight. It's vital, this work that we do, to educate students and advance knowledge. But MIT's mission demands more much, much more from all of us. It demands that we use our knowledge to tackle humanity's greatest global challenges. 
And we embrace these challenges because we know that the people of MIT can deliver and make a better world. And that's why, in May 2016, we launched MIT's campaign for a better world. It's focused on core priorities that empower the people of MIT and lay the foundation for their work to tackle humanity's great global challenges. And the success of this campaign, MIT's success in making a better world, depends on the dedication and participation of each, you, each of you in this room tonight. We need you to help inspire the whole family of MIT with your example. By attending events like this one tonight, and like the ones offered by your local alumni groups. By supporting the MIT campaign for a better world with your gifts, and by fostering the value and practice of service to humanity in your workplaces and communities. Many of you here tonight have already joined in this work. And on behalf of President Reif and MIT, I thank you. Thank you. Many of you have told us that your generosity to MIT has a simple inspiration. You have seen that a gift to MIT is truly a gift to the world. What makes this true is that to the people of MIT, humanity's, urges, urge, uh, sorry, humanity's urgent challenges are invitations to action. From our unwavering commitment to fundamental science, to our zest for innovation and collaboration, across disciplines. MIT is turning promising theories into practical solutions. MIT is focused on ensuring that everyone in the world can benefit from clean energy and clean water, from brilliant design and breathtaking artistic works, from nourishing food and nanotechnology, and from improved health care and increased access to education. MIT is also firmly focused on the future. And we recognize that our shared future hinges on the responsible and ethical evolution of artificial intelligence and computing technologies. Technologies that are poised to fundamentally transform every aspect of life, from how we learn to the nature of work, and from national economies to the health of societies. Technologies that will be the defining forces in the next phase of human history. In this galvanizing moment, MIT aspires to be the true north of computing and artificial intelligence. And that's why we announced the creation of the MIT Stephen A. Schwartzman College of Computing just last October. Through this college, we will integrate computing, students, sorry, computing studies and research throughout the institute. We'll shape the future direction of computing and AI with insights from disciplines spanning all five of MIT schools and will create the next generation of highly trained computational thinkers and doers who can offer the world both technological proficiency and the cultural, ethical, and historical con consciousness to use technology for the common good. Above all, we aim to position the United States to be a world leader in computing and AI. This is how MIT will help shape the future of AI and the future of itself. MIT will lead the way. Our objectives for the new college and our campaign for a better world are, admittedly, bold. They are a natural leap for an institution that helped give rise to the computer revolution and that has had a distinguished track record of invention and innovation for over six decades. They have also generated strong interest and inspired exceptional generosity, including from many of you here tonight. On behalf, on behalf of MIT, I thank you. As of today, the MIT community has come together during this campaign to raise slightly more than $4.9 billion through nearly 100,000 gifts of all amounts from alumni, parents, friends, foundations, and corporations. 4.9 billion thank yous. By the way, that 100,000 Individual gifts includes gifts from more than half our living alumni. A great statement about how all of you feel, I hope, about the Institute. At the same time, as we prepare to launch the MIT Stephen A. Schwartzman College of Computing, we know that supporting its vision to educate leaders who will shape the future of computing will take very significant 
new resources. We've already encountered strong interest in the college, not only from MIT's longtime supporters, but from new philanthropic sources as well. And given this new landscape, we are taking the important step of increasing the campaign target by $1 billion to set a new goal of raising $6 billion. I know you'll help us get there. And this new goal reflects our characteristic optimism, our uncommon instinct for working across disciplines, and our unwavering belief that the talented people of the MIT community can invent a better future for everyone. Now, tonight, we will hear how MIT is advancing the science and teaching of learning to make a better world. Three MIT scholars will talk about their work and then participate in a Q&A session with you. We'll be collecting your questions uh, via the Poll Everywhere app. So please um, use your mobile devices to share your questions with the, or using the URL on the screen behind me. And I'm asked to point out to you, you may have noticed that the uh, mobile reception in this room isn't great. It's not designed by an MIT person, clearly. <laughs> so please use the hotel Wi-Fi. The login and password uh, are on the screen, and that should get you there. Our speakers will be Eric Kloffer, Professor and Director of the Scheller Teacher Education Program in the MIT Education Arcade. Jenna Hong, a graduating senior in computer science and cognitive science. And Sanjay Sarma, MIT's Vice President for Open Learning, who is also the Fred Fort Flowers and Daniel Fort Flowers Professor of Mechanical Engineering. It is my great pleasure to invite Professor Eric Kloffer to the stage to kick this off. Eric. Good, e good evening. I'm sure that some of you have kids at home tonight and you're hoping they're doing something productive and not playing video games like Fortnite. Well, they probably are playing video games like Fortnite, but the good news is it may not be a complete waste of time. I'm Eric Klopfer and I create and study video games and virtual reality experiences that are designed to address learning needs not currently being addressed by schools today. What are video games? Many of you may think of them as something that boys play in basements where they shoot things and eat Doritos and drink Mountain Dew. Well, they, they are that. <laughs> but there's so much more than that as well. Just this past week, over 10 million people watched a live concert in the video game Fortnite. What makes video games special? I think it boils down to what I'd call hard fun. Hard fun is a term coined by my late colleague Seymour Papert, who found that kids were having fun not in spite of what they were doing being hard, but because it was hard. They wrestled with challenging problems, and they eventually overcame those problems, and the fun came from that overcoming of those challenges. That's much like, that's much like we see in video games as well, as you can see on the screen here. A video game is not fun. It, a kid will leave it if a, if a game is too hard. They'll leave it if it's too easy as well. It's only when we keep them at the edge of their expertise where we also keep them engaged. We need to make school more like video games. It needs to be about solving contextualized problems. It needs to be about working collaboratively together in teams. It needs to be about hard fun. This is the work that we do in my lab. We work on designing experiences that are hard fun. We use new technologies, often through video games, to address these learning needs and to make hard fun. We use machine learning to diagnose learning difficulties. We use virtual reality experiences to help students develop new identities and explore complex co spatial processes. But we don't do this in an academic vacuum. Instead, we employ a process of design-based research. In design-based research, we work in real schools with real teachers to understand the problems that they face. Problems like, how do you teach algebra, geometry, or genetics? Or how do you get kids to work collaboratively in teams to solve problems? That's what you see on the screen here and here. Um, this is a game called Clever. Uh, on the left, you see a, a tablet view. On the right, you see a virtual reality view. The students in these two views must, must work together to diagnose and fix a genetic defect with this cell in front of them. Only by working collaboratively can they solve this problem. But we can't end this with design alone. It's also about implementation. So we work in schools around the corner, in Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville, and we work in schools around the world. We're just wrapping up a project now with a small-scale project with 1,000 schools in India. 
because this is a global problem. Jobs are being displaced by technology. Technology is changing the way we interact with each other and the world around us. But technology can also be part of the solution. We don't have an ed school at MIT to work on this solution, but we also don't have a cancer school or an energy school. Instead, we see these as interdisciplinary problems where we need to bring together diverse expertise to solve these problems. At MIT, the Office of Open Learning has become the focal point for this work. It brings together work in my lab, the Teaching Systems Lab, the Jamil World Education Lab, the MIT Integrated Learning Initiative, and the, the Center for Advanced Virtual Reality, to, num to name just a few. This is not the first time, you may not know this, but this is not the first time that MIT has risen to a global educational challenge. When the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the United States responded in the 1960s with uh, a, an increased emphasis on science education. MIT, in turn, responded with the PSSC physics curriculum, what became the standard in physics education for decades to come. We face another Sputnik moment today. <clears throat> the, 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 our education system lags behind the technology, but technology can be part of the solution, and MIT can lead the way. Together, we can make a better world. And for that, I thank you. We are here tonight because of a story. You are here for yours, as a tribute to the peers and mentors at MIT who inspired you. And I'm here to tell you about mine, who are helping shape the future of our beloved institute. Telling a story is something that we've been doing as humans for eons. In essence, it's exactly this that makes us human, by interacting with each other in our rich social environments, we encode, store, and retrieve memories all in order to better understand and communicate who we are. But if memory is a key function to storytelling, then forms of dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, takes that link away from us. Patients of Alzheimer's lose the ability to remember. And actually, they still have the ability to process information and store it in the brain, no problem. But the missing link actually lies in retrieving them and making sense of them. So, in a way, they're lost. Lost in time and space, because they're losing the stories of their lives. I believe that artificial intelligence can change that. My name is Jenna Hong, and I'm a senior in computer science and cognitive science, and I am passionate about the human mind. I study the science and engineering of intelligence in order to better understand co cognitive functions like perception and reason. I think about the very act of thinking, using deep learning and statistical modeling, all to represent the way we interact with the world around us. We are born with 100 billion neurons in our brains. That's about how many stars there are in the Milky Way. All of our neurons fire together and converge over the course of our development to build an inter integral and very extensive network of information that form the basis of how we learn conceptual patterns, and more broadly, how we develop the theoretical frameworks for intelligence. As highly evolved as AI is today, a computer simply can't do that. AI is great at specific domain-bound tasks, like playing a game of chess, or identifying traffic patterns, or processing natural language, and that's great. But still, AI is brittle and ungeneralizable, making it susceptible to errors and difficult to scale. It's not yet robust, and at the same time that we introduce its exciting new applications, we must regulate it and be mindful around its ethical impact. For a computer to become a true storytelling machine, AI needs to learn first how to break down a narrative. Using intuitive physics and psychology, it must decode mental states, tapping into things like emotion and creativity, goals, belief systems, common sense, and conceptual intuition. And to some extent, we do have algorithms that can do that, using you know, deep reinforced neural networks or relying on rule-based systems. The thing is, humans don't always follow rules. We make inferences and we make exceptions. 
We're emotionally driven, and we don't need millions of data points to get there. So I study the exact moment where our natural learning processes can be augmented by computers. At MIT, in my classes, I'm pushed to learn about how to draw parallels between the brain and an operating system, a neuron and an electrical circuit. Using these tools, I conduct research at the Media Lab. In the Fluid Interfaces group, we're designing a multimodal augmented reality interface that digitalizes something called the Mind Palace, which is something that dates back to ancient Greek philosophy. The Mind Palace leverages imagination. Basically, you visualize a space you know very well, and then you anchor mental images based on particular points in that path. And in order to access that newly associated information, all you have to do is rewalk the path. As it turns out, spatial navigation and episodic memory formation rely on the same region of the brain, the hippocampus. And so what I'm trying to do is use audiovisual cues to trigger neural firing in the hippocampus to consolidate or strengthen these sensory memories with the spatial memories. And I hope that this interface will allow people to feel empowered to overcome learning barriers and memory impairments. MIT is a hub of creativity. I am surrounded by people with big ideas and the dedicated spirit to pursue them. And not only do we share this vision, we urge others to do the same. My friends are pushing me constantly to dive into problems that I find meaningful, and our unique solutions create a momentum that drives innovation. MIT as a community shines because we care about what we do as well as what it means. We're driven to understand our passions and communicate our impact. In other words, we're just a bunch of storytellers. So the next time you tell your story at MIT, I hope you remember the ways in which you worked then, and still do, to make an inspired impact. But I hope you also remember that memory is a form of time travel, and the very ability to tell your story connects you to humans from the very beginning of time to beyond our lifetimes. At MIT, we're working to give the gift of memory because engineering something as timeless as storytelling is how we can make a better world. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a very special place right now in research, uh, in education at MIT. We want to fundamentally rethink learning and education, one of our most important activities as humans. Hello, my name is Sanjay Sarma. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering, vice president for open learning at MIT. You know, think about this. 18 years ago, in 2001, MIT made a very uh, controversial decision. It decided to give its entire curriculum away for free to the world. A lot of people thought, how could they possibly do it? It's going to destroy the business model. Now look back today in 2019. Today, we have had 250 million unique people come to MIT and download courses, more than 2,500 courses. Facebook has how many? About 1.7 billion folks. But what do you see on Facebook? Here's my recipe for falafel, <laughs> right? But what do people download from OpenCourseWare? Linguistics, architecture, quantum mechanics, computer science, all the topics that Eric and Jenna and others have spoken about. And then 10 years later, we repeated this. We launched MITx. MITx was launched literally with nothing. We just said, we will create a free, a freemium access model for people anywhere in the world to take courses. And the first course was launched in 2012. Today, we've reached MIT itself has reached 3.5 million people, and edX, which is a spin-off that MIT and Harvard created, has reached 13 million unique people, 46 million enrollments. Er uh, Eric Grimson, his one course, 6006XX, has reached more than a million people. That is 10 times more than the living alumni of MIT. <laughs> As he likes to joke, he may be to blame for the state of the software industry in this country. 
No, qu quite the opposite. It's extraordinary what we've done. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because demographics are changing. This is the gig economy. People work, they freelance. Learning is not something you do for four years. Learning is something you do every day forever. It's also, it's also a time when technology is changing. You know, if you were a C-sharp expert, you need to become a Python expert tomorrow. And finally, uh, in this world, in this day and age, everyone has to become the CEO of their own life. They have to become the chief learning officer of their own life. They have to become the CTO of their own life. And essentially what we're putting together is a toolkit for individuals to take charge of their lives. How are we doing this? How is MIT doing this? Now, we aren't doing this with guesswork. We're doing it by understanding the science of learning, which Jenna and Eric spoke so eloquently about. How do we form memories? How do we forget? It turns out we learn actually through forgetting. You have to learn, sort of forget, and relearn. The power of curiosity. Curiosity releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine, which improves learning. Maria Montessori had it right. We've proved that mens et manus, the adage, the motto, turns out to be exactly right. We learn with our hands. The science proves it because the motor cortex getting, gets engaged. We're also, obviously, this being MIT, delving into the latest technologies that learning can, can benefit from. Eric talked about virtual reality, augmented reality. We, as Eric mentioned, we just launched a new center on, on virtual and augmented reality. We're working on AI, using AI to improve teaching. We're also working on teaching AI to children. If AI is our future, shouldn't children learn how to do AI? It's actually doable now. So we're working on that. These are all some of the activities we're engaged in. We're also working on blockchain. I've struggled to find a killer app for blockchain. <laughs> I've always wanted to work on blockchain, but I think we've found one, which is certificates, digital certificates. Wouldn't it be great if you could guarantee that a certificate wasn't fake just by clicking on it? So if someone put it on their LinkedIn page, you could say, they got it, they're online. That's the killer app for blockchain. But I'll end with this. These are all just numbers. They seem very abstract. I hope all of you have logged into edX. Um, but I want to tell you that outside in the real world, the impact is tremendous. I was in Jordan two Sundays ago, where MIT ran a refugee workshop. It's a program called REACT. It was started actually by an MIT professor who himself was a refugee, Admir Masic. He escaped Bosnia as a refugee, and he struggled through a life in Croatia, emigrated to Germany, Italy, he eventually ended up at MIT, and he said, I'm going to do something for refugees. And through him, we've created a program in which Syrian refugees in Jordan get degrees in data science and in uh, developmental economics. And then we run a boot camp, and that's the boot camp I was at. At the very same time, while I was out there, taking advantage of these, of these new tools and meeting people and talking to, them, talking to them face to face. We were running another workshop at MIT where we were educating teachers at MIT, teachers to go teach in those Syrian uh, refugee camps. And I flew back and I went to this, uh, this event in, uh, in, at MIT where we had a bunch of teachers and there were students sitting around with coaches and one, and who do I find coaching? an MIT executive me committee member, Diana Walsh. That is how deeply we're engaged. We don't just talk, we create impact. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so now is the time for me to begin our Q&A session. So Jenna and Eric, if you could join us. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Eric, for joining. Uh, just to remind everyone, as Chancellor Grimson explained, we'll be using the Poll Everywhere app, and you'll see it on the, on the screen in a minute. Please sign in, and if you can share your questions for us, uh, we'll see them. I'll see them here, and I'll, I'll ask questions of, of our two wonderful colleagues here. But let me just kick things off by asking maybe you, Jenna, 
Um, what do you think will happen in 20 years? What is education in 20 years? Great. Um, so before I answer that question, I think I have to like pay my respects to online learning and how much it's revolutionized you know, all of the students, not just at MIT, but throughout the world. So um, being able to see like learning happen on websites formally through like structured EDX systems, but also informally through how like people can communicate from country to country, I think um, Learning through communication will happen on different types of modalities, including VR and AR. So maybe in different like types of mixed reality. Um, so all these different interfaces, I think, will connect people. Eric, what do you think? 20 years from now. Well, I sort of have two perspectives on this, the pessimistic perspective and the optimistic perspective. The pessimistic perspective comes from looking back 20 years and it looks pretty much like it does today. That's because MIT wasn't involved, very involved now. So it gives us <laughs> the optimistic correct. view. So the optimistic view. The optimistic view is, as I mentioned, I think we are at another Sputnik moment. We are at an inflection point where I think we need to make a change, um, where we need to change what we do in the classrooms. And I do think that we'll see in the next five years, definitely 10 years, I mean, my, in my optimistic and I hope realistic view, I think we'll see change in classrooms that are moving from a more sort of factual retention-based view to really focusing on skills and practices and things that are transferable and, and more applicable in the modern world. Terrific. Jenna, you talked about the science of learning, and you know, we've all talked about it in different ways. Mm -hmm. How will that impact learning? And also, while you're at that, will we personalize learning more, do you think? You know, I think that's a really good question. I think being able to kind of hone in on the brain and understand how it is we pick up information will help us like change the way learning is geared toward the brain rather than forcing the brain into our current learning system. So I think that's a really good first step is to learn how to structure information in a way that our brains can digest it well. Um, I think personalization is a really great idea. I think we have a lot of tools to do that using machine learning models to learn how one specific student picks up something while another doesn't. Yeah. Um, but I think that the impact will be in being able to like expose students to everything that's out there before personalization. Got it. So give them breadth and then... Right. And then hone in. And on. then hone in. Eric, can you sneak some learning into these Fortnite things? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I, I think I think video games already teach some things. And do they really? They do really. Okay. I mean, it, well, okay. if you look at if you look at the kinds of skills we need to be teaching kids today, they're the kinds of things they're doing in video games. Now, I don't think that that's going to be a sufficient solution, and you can certainly spend too much time playing Fortnite, as I have a, a, a sample size of one at home that shows me that's the case. Uh, but I do think that 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 learning needs to look a lot more like that. It needs to look a lot more like those games, and it doesn't necessarily need to be about games, but it needs to reflect the kinds of experiences that we're creating in those. And as we, in, do you think you can personalize uh, through games? Can games sort of figure out what the student's interested in, as Jenna said? And Ab absolutely. I mean, it's really, uh, you know, what, what I think game designers have done, maybe not through a science, but through, through an art, is they figured out a way to keep people uh, engaged in that. But I think there's another thing that games have done really well as well with respect to personalization that's really important. Personalization sometimes means, like, everybody doing their own thing. Um, but it's, that's not going to be sufficient in, in an educational system. It needs to be doing your own thing, but it needs to be about interacting with all your peers as well, because socialization is, is an important part of learning and an important force in learning. And again, that's something that games have done well. It's something that gives you a personalized experience, but also helps you figure out how you interact with other people around you. Do, do you game, Jenna? I used to game when I was when And I was you stopped? A kid. <laughs> you don't have the time now at MIT? So change, change of, uh, of topic. Um, if the purpose of education is, is it to find and foster diamonds in the rough? Is it to educate, you know, what we're doing with open learning is we're sort of casting a wide net and discovering amazing people around the world. Where does education fit in terms of recognizing talent, pulling it in? Jenna. So I think that already the students at MIT are kind of the diamonds in the rough in a way. Um, but I think the extra mile goes into the students who re recognize theory and recognize the applications that they can put that into. So having that desire to bring what you learn in a math class and in a physics class to real world applications in healthcare or education. So, so, so for example, you talked earlier about giving students wide exposure. So one thing would be, 
how do you give them wide exposure and maybe ignite their curiosity? Is that sort of where you're going with that? Yeah, and I think um, already MIT professors are naturally really good at that. Even in you know every lecture that I've been to, um, a professor will talk about the theories and the formulas, but they'll also sneak in a little bit about their research and how they're using what they're teaching in order to do something in the world. And that itself sparks creativity in students. So, so Eric, do you think that we can do the same thing to students around the world? Can we use games to to spark curiosity, you know, change it less from a one way, you know, here's what you need to learn to a more interactive thing? Absolutely. It could, I mean, games and other kinds of things that we're doing at MIT can be a, definitely a part of the process of making this interactive. I do want to sort of say that in re, with respect to your original question, um, I, I, we, and I don't mean just me and my lab, I mean the people in, the, in JWell, the World Education Lab, and other parts of MIT, one of the really cornerstones of the things that we think about in education is not just how we reach you know, the, the top few percentage, but how we reach everyone. Um, the kinds of systems and the kinds of tools that we create are things that are, are designed to reach the diamonds in the rough, the kids who we haven't reached before. We often will go into a classroom, we work in it with a teacher, and we say, wow, that kid must be a dynamite student. And they say, that student hasn't said anything before in my class. It's only today through this experience that's really brought them out. So we try to use these experiences to bring out those diamonds in the rough and really reach everyone because we feel like education is a right that everyone has and we need to be able to use our tools, our engineering, our science to be able to reach all those people. So one question that's come up here is what is the role of the, um, the human in, in this? What, what are real human beings? Do we have a job, Eric, or are you going to make <laughs> Well, I can say this partially selfishly, yeah. although I have tenure, so. <laughs> <You're good. laughs> so, uh, so what's the role? I, I, I do think, so again, this gets back to personalization and the way that machines fit into the process. There are some people who sort of see their vision as kids will go into a school, they'll go into a room full of computers, and they'll all have personalized, excellent instruction from the computer, and then they'll go home. That is not the way I see it, and it's not the way that, that most of my colleagues at MIT see it. I don't think anybody at MIT sees it that way. It's a very much a personalized process where adults need to be in the room. Adults are people who are mentors. They're people who can think creatively. They're people who can make connections between students that they haven't seen before. So it's very much a part of our process to think about how we train teachers to use these new tools, to think creatively, to be important members of the classroom. And it's something that they want to do. Um, and it's something that we feel like the technology is really going to be able to change the role. It's become a, um, it's become a sort of a trite saying to say it's going from the stage on the stage to a guide on the side. But that is really the way that we see it. That it's, it's something that's going to be a guide that takes you through a learning experience that really draws upon their life experience and, um, and becomes... Uh, you know, I think even more professionalized than the way we see teaching now. Jenna, have you found the actual human professor <laughs> somewhat marginally useful to you? Of course. Um, I think the human portion is especially important of like the emotional aspect. I think professors are the ones who recognize creativity and curiosity, you know, and are able to feed in and be right now like the personalization factor between the computer, which has all of the, you know, educational videos and the student. So, so the, the, the computer is sort of one way and the, and, the, and the individual interaction, I'm sure not just with the professors, but with your peers, with, with the TAs, yeah, et cetera, friends, is what helps you sort of tweak your understanding and so on, right? Yeah. So another question that's come up is what, what do you think is the role of liberal arts? Liberal arts. In, uh, in education, you know, because there's, there's, <laughs> in, in the future of education, will, we, will everyone just do computer science? <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> that's a question. So, I'm just uh, reading it out. I get so I, I, I'm a biologist by training, but I've, I'm, I'm currently in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, um, and and I think the humanities, the liberal arts, are so important. They're important for. Um, for teaching ways of thinking. They're important for thinking about the way that we engage in the world. They're important for thinking about the way we think about ethics and the way that we think about uh, society, the way that we think about our, our human mission. Um, and I, and I've, I've seen actually in the, in the nearly 20 years I've been at MIT that actually the, the, the humanities, arts, and social sciences have increased in their importance, not only in the minds of the faculty, but in the minds of the students. Um, it's really become something that they really they, they deeply value and and uh, and has definitely become a part of the culture, and I, I'm really happy to see that. Jenna? Yeah. I actually am a huge fan of the humanities department at MIT. Um, 
a lot of the faculty that have touched me in my uh, career at MIT are part of the Shas community. Um, and kind of similarly to how we're establishing the College of Computing, I believe that like the humanities, arts, and social sciences provide some kind of framework and like a baseline to our general education, helping us to understand like how this really fits into the humanitarian problems that we care about. Um, yeah. Terrific. I should say that uh, I was uh, yesterday. A few of us were in um, in New York, where the the Metropolitan Museum of New York, MIT, and Microsoft. Uh, we had held a hackathon in December, where we brought together pieces of art from the Met, um, and experts in technology uh, from MIT and from Microsoft, and they built AI programs to merge art, invent new art. They used a particular form of uh, AI called Generative Adversarial Networks, GANs. And the results were really amazing. I mean, this sort of mix of art and technology. Um, and the other piece that was interesting there was open, which is can we make it open so people can mix things and you know create new art. So another question that's come up, actually several people have asked is, how can we combat inequality of education? and democratize education and expand educational access. Maybe, Jenna, that comes back to that first question about diamonds in the rough. Right, right. So I think that with immersive interfaces, not just the internet, but um, maybe if AR systems or other VR systems were more widely available to students around the world, I think that they could take advantage of the many resources that are you know, online. Um, and I think like that opens up a lot of possibilities for finding those diamonds in the rough. I mean, it could be, for example, a student at MIT has access to a lab. Right. But a student far away may not have access to a lab. So maybe through VR, they can enter a virtual lab and engage in an activity. Right, right. whether that... it's learning um, how to do something in a lab or learning a language by like augmented like words floating up in your uh, vision. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Eric, you work in this space. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, certainly uh, everybody who I work with at MIT sees this as an important issue. It's, it's I think, it's the, the foundation of, of a lot of we, the work we do in the Jamil World Education Lab is, is democratizing education within the United States and, and worldwide. Um, and it's a matter of thinking about ways we reduce costs and that we provide high quality education to, to people. It's about open, as you mentioned, a word that's obviously important in open learning. Um, and, uh, and it's a, also about partnerships. Um, so it's not something that we feel like um, is something that we can sort of hand down from the mountain of MIT, um, but rather something that we develop partnerships, whether it's in neighboring communities or in countries around the world, to figure out how we develop those solutions that are unique and customized to those particular places and that work in those places. And I think, again, that's something that we're doing really well at MIT. We're, we're opening our doors and we're, we're leaving those doors and going out and seeking those partnerships, and, and a lot of them are being very fruitful. Actually, there's a specific question to you, which is why, why do you believe a class needs to be like a video game? So, <laughs> so uh, I, I'll qualify that I, 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 I think about this in two different ways. One is that I think we can actually use educational video games in classrooms, and the other is that we can use some of the designs of what makes video games a successful medium today to create our educational solutions. So it's not necessarily making, there's, there's a school um, in New York um, uh, that's really sort of modeled after what video games do. And you'll walk into a classroom, you won't actually see people playing video games, but they're designed around some of the same principles of uh, principles like um, learning how to uh, learn something in one context and apply it in another context. Um, so that's one thing we see in video games. You have to learn how to use um, a tool in one context and then you have to apply that tool in a new context. It's something that actually humans don't do very well. We don't transfer learning to new situations very well. We need to be scaffolded, help to understand how we apply a mathematical equation we learn in one context to another context. Video games actually do that really well. Um, and we want to be able to model how you do that. Video games provide feedback to people. You know how you're doing in different kinds of metrics, and you can value those metrics in different kinds of ways. We should provide those kinds of metrics in educational systems so that people know how they're doing and get that feedback. Um, they, uh, they can make choices, meaningful choices. Um, oftentimes, kids don't get to make meaningful choices in the schools. They do in video games. We need to make them have those opportunities to make meaningful choices in schools. So that's a lot of the ways. I mean, I could go off on, on, a, on a litany of those, those reasons. And we, we recently developed a book called Resonant Games, which is a lot about our principles. It's an, it's an open, you can find it openly on MIT uh, Press. 
Um, but it's about those principles we distilled that connect what goes on in video games and how we apply those to learning. It would be great to write, uh, create a product about open and then actually sell it. Yes. <laughs> um, Jenna, what, a question that's come up is, uh, in, you know, it's hard to pay attention online, right? Or you can sort of get distracted and so on. And in person, there's coaching, there's, um, um, there's a sort of an, uh, a peer, almost peer pressure to, make, to, to get the student to focus. As a student, do you think uh, online could, in, under, what con under what circumstances would online work well? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of different forms that already are in place and that could come up later. And so in these like immersive interfaces that I'm talking about, I imagine things where students are learning by visualizing the applications of the theories. So say if I'm like a biomedical student, maybe I'm looking at a surgery online or with an augmented reality interface. Or if I'm an electrical engineering student, then maybe um, I can use AR to put together these different circuits and see actually like in front of me how everything comes together. And so I think like the potential for online is to draw those lines and help people understand those connections. Um, whereas like maybe if you're at home or even just in a big lecture hall with a lot of people around you, you don't get that personalized or one-on-one -on -one, like feedback and interactive ex like experience. Eric, how would you evaluate online learning? Uh, so so I'll, I'll talk about two parts. One is how to apply online learning, and the other is, is how, we, how we evaluate it. So, um, and I think those are very much related. So the way I see applying, there's, there's one application that's become common and I think is very good, the idea of the, what's called the flipped classroom. We sort of learn the content beforehand and then you come into the classroom and you're able to apply it. So you do labs, you do hands-on activities. Um, but I also think it's about flipping in another direction. It's about flipping it to sort of a demand-driven. So we know that actually people learn better when they want to learn the thing that they want to learn, that, that we're teaching them. So we can set things up with problems beforehand. So um, it might be about uh, a design challenge. It might be about um, a, a video game challenge. It might be about uh, uh, just some other sort of lab, lab that someone's working on. And then what happens is they need to know things in order to complete that challenge. And that's when they go and they draw those online resources. They go and listen to that lecture. They read that, that text. They watch that video. And when they want to learn it now, they, they want to know it because they want to apply it, now all of a sudden it makes sense and they can retain that much better and they can apply that in new situations. And I think that's so important to learning is, is that kind of flipped situation. And so I think actually one of the ways we can really evaluate, evaluate online learning is how much it makes those flips, how much it flips learning to, from the videos coming outside of class and the lectures coming outside of class and to being a much more demand-driven situation where they're demanding that, that kind of educational resource. Uh, Jenna, will college degrees become obsolete soon? <laughs> I hope not. No? What do you think? I mean, um, do, do, will people still go for four years to college, let's say 10 years from now? Or will they sort of consume as on demand? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say like whether college itself um, is necessary, but I honestly think that the past four years of my life have been tremendously um, helpful in growing, both as a learner and um, in terms of just becoming an upperclassman and having that desire to share what I know and what I've learned um, to others, um, kind of instilling, MIT has definitely instilled that passion for like service as well for me. So I think that you know the college experience is not just about going to five classes a week. You know, it's about um, interacting with the people who study something completely different from you. And it's about talking to professors who know so much more than you, but are really interested to know what you're passionate in. So I think, in my opinion, I think college is great. I think having a degree is super helpful, um, but in 10 years, maybe it'll be different. Eric, do you think that uh, technology AI can be used to mine by parents and by, especially by parents, to, this literally question is, can parents mine their children's talents and traits using AI? <laughs> so I, I don't know I necessarily use that word, um, but, but I, I do think that, um, so one of the challenges that we face um, is that we have, in all aspects of society today, is we have so much data. Um, and as learning moves online, um, we have lots of learning data that, that's available to us as well. 
but it's a question of how does that become actionable? Um, how, do you, how do you give a, a teacher or a parent actionable data from that that they can digest and understand and apply? Um, and so that's a big field of research right now. So we, the first wave has been dashboards. We're just gonna give everybody all the numbers. But nobody wants to see all those numbers. Teachers don't have the time to see numbers from the hundreds of students that they have. Parents don't necessarily know what to do with those numbers. They're not necessarily trained to, to either, either in understanding the numbers themselves or, or in, in education. So we need to be able to use machine learning to give them advice. So it might be about uh, finding the student who's really struggling. It might be about figuring out ways you match up different students to help with, them, with each other. It might be about uh, flagging to you where your kid's having difficulty, but also where they're having great success and giving some hints um, about where you might go with that, about where you might sort of cultivate their interest, how you might apply, have them apply an interest that they're developing in one area to a new area. So I certainly think it can help us, both teachers and parents, develop new insights into the way that our kids are learning and, and what we can do about that. There was a question actually uh, uh, asking me, what is the completion rate uh, of courses, uh, of online courses? And it's 5%, 4%. And the way I address it is, would you be happy if it were 100%? Well, probably not. The courses are probably too easy. Would you be happy if it was 0%? Eh, it's not good either. So obviously it should be between zero and 100%. <laughs> and then I say, what are MIT's, uh, how many, what's the percentage of students that gets admitted to MIT? It's like 7%. So that's about the order of magnitude. So when people take a course on quantum mechanics with nothing but a certificate coming out of it, if 5% finish an MIT level course, that's pretty good. And with the MicroMasters, where there's actually a credential attached, the percentage uh, who finishes. Can I, can I comment on this as well? Because yeah. I, I think you better I, agree with me, though. I, I, <laughs> I definitely agree it should be between zero and 100 <laughs> percent, <laughs> because that's hard fun. It's in between. Um, no, I, I think it's actually a, a, a symptom, a good symptom of this sort of on-demand learning that people are sort of having now. So it's not about I need to have necessarily a whole course. Sometimes I just need to learn something because I now have a need to learn that thing. And that might be a module within a course. It might be about um, uh, different sections of the course. And so I think people are in situations where they're needing to continually learn. And they're finding these resources online as great ways to do that learning. And that doesn't necessarily mean I need to take a course from beginning till end. J Jenna, what do you think? Um, when you consume online content, do you sort of laser focus on the thing you care about and leave all the other stuff out? Honestly, yes. So yeah. I think um, it kind of goes back to Eric's point on demand-driven learning. So I think what's really cool is that when you, if you look at something online and you say, hey, I want to know how that works, or I want to know how someone programmed a video game, um, and you Google it, right? You look it up, you find an online course about it, and you find the subtitle of the part that you're interested in, whether it's you know um, programming in a particular language or like learning a different language. Um, I think that it's okay for people to partially complete a course as long as they know what they're trying to get out of it. And as long as they um, use that course and use the resources that they have available to them in order to kind of go off and use that as a benchmark. Uh, the questions that come up again, which is well, how important is human inter interaction? And um, you know, Eric used the term, the our traditional way of teaching is the sage on the stage. And the fact is that, you know, if a professor is standing on a stage and you have, you know, uh, about 50 students and they're talking, that's not really human interaction. And that can go to video. And the advantage of the video, unlike a professor who's talking, is you can pause them. <laughs> yeah. You might w wish you could have paused some of your professors when they're talking, but you cannot. And you can replay and you can, re you know, you can see the transcript and so on. And in fact, what we're trying to do is displace the sort of one-to-many time with one-on-one, -on -one, uh, replace it with one-on-one -on -one time, where the professor is actually talking to a student and actually coaching them. And the students are talking with each other and the TAs are coaching them and external coaches. So that's the idea of the flipped classroom. So the question came up again. I just want to there's emphasize a, there's that. Another, there's another aspect to that, which is that human interaction also happens online. Yeah. Um, and the way that we sort of see some courses um, you know, you do watch videos and answer multiple choice questions, but there are some courses online and an increasing number where the human interactions within those online courses is very important, whether it's group work or peer feedback or um, people working collaboratively in teams on projects. 
Um, some of these courses are relying on this, and we're getting better and better at facilitating that kind of online human interaction where you're learning from your peers as well as the expert. And I think that's another important aspect of, of, of that human engagement and learning. So last question for both of you, which is, Parents are concerned about the impact of screen time. Are, are there negative neurological effects and how do you minimize the impact? You want me to start? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> this is a little bit of a can of worms here. Um, so it, it, it depends on the age of the kid. I mean, so there's some early guidelines that show that very young kids should have very limited screen time. Um, but I'll say a couple of things about this. So one is that um, not all screen time is the same. Uh, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like paper time. <laughs> You know, what am I looking at on that paper? Am I reading? Am I, am I looking at pictures? Am I, um, you know, I, I might be doing different things. I might be baking paper airplanes. I, those are different activities and they have different values. Same with screens. If I'm watching videos, if I'm, I'm playing sort of, there are, there are mindless video games. If I'm playing good video games, if I'm creating things, my, my interactions are all different and that screen time varies um, widely. There is a, a fair bit of research that's coming out on this in terms of impacts on screen time. Um, there's a huge variation in what we're seeing from screen time. And there's actually was just a meta study done on, on screen time research. And that shows that part of that is because people interpret data differently. They're looking at different outcomes. So it's very sort of messy in terms of what we're seeing from that screen time data. Some of it does show negative impacts, but it's very small impacts. Um, like, uh, and it's... Um, uh, you know, it's on the order of, of, of sort of other really negligible, it's maybe statistically significant, but not, um, not practically significant. And we do see with some of these other uses, we see that screen time can have really great benefits um, for kids in terms of developing their cognitive processes for, for teaching them some of these skills. So I think the really key thing is to think about what you're doing on that screen time, not just how much time you're spending on that screen. Jenna, did you have a lot of screen time growing up? I think I did. <laughs> um, I definitely so had a good if, balance. If all our kids can turn out like you, we have hope. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, I do think I had a balance of paper and screen and outdoors, but um, I think a lot of it has to do with mindset, right? Like the way I approach this question is that there are neurological like effects of looking at a blue screen or an orange screen um, until you sleep, right? But I think that the way we look at a computer as something that can, again, augment or enhance our cognitive ability rather than something that can, you know, engulf our life um, is really important both from the standpoint of a parent and a student. So um, using it as a tool, using it as one of the many tools that, can you, that you can use to learn is probably the most important thing. Okay, well, I think that's a great way to close. I think you heard it here the first time, screen time ain't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to thank our extraordinary colleagues. Thank you very much. Um, so, so thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we, uh, we invite you to join us uh, for the reception and for dessert outside. Thanks very much. <laughs>